Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Viral Vigela, and I'm the account manager for X-ray CT technology with Rodaku. I'm here with our co-presenters, Angela Criswell and Aya Takasi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you all for attending Rodaku's uh, webinar series, Ask the Expert. The best way to learn something new is talking to an expert. Our series will cover various topics and we will be joined by industry experts to help better understand CT techniques. Today, we would like to welcome back Dr. Mike Marsh as the expert. Mike is with Object Research System and is the Dragonfly product manager. He will be discussing deep learning image segmentation from the Dragonfly software. But before we start, a few housekeeping items. For today, uh, this is going to be an interactive session. We will be taking your questions live during the webcast and answering them during the session. Please don't wait until the end to ask. As usual, please submit those questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We won't be monitoring the raised hand function and I'll be posting relevant links in the chat window. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible during the webinar and we'll respond to any unanswered questions directly after the session is completed. If for whatever reason you have difficulty viewing the webinar live, please note it is being recorded and you will be able to view the recording beginning tomorrow. With that being said, I'll turn it over to Angela and I. Thank you, Viral, and thank you very much for joining us, Mike. So you're ready to take over the screen share? Uh, yeah, I think I'm ready. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. All right, I guess you guys can see my screen. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, yes. thank you for inviting me here. Um, my name is Mike Marsh. I'm the product manager for Dragonfly. Um, you know, imposter syndrome is real. Uh, somebody calls you an expert and you turn around like, who, me? Um, but I think I'm going to be able to tell you a little something today about deep learning. Um, I've been the product manager for Dragonfly uh, since about 2015. And it's a product where we introduced uh, machine learning and then deep learning and then in 2017 and 2018. And so we've been working with imaging scientists for a number of years now to enable image segmentation in particular, but also image enhancement with deep learning models. So I'm happy to stand in as the expert today to address the questions that Aya has for me. So with that, I think I'll uh, go to the first slide. That's a poll question. It's a poll question. Exactly. So this will be our first polling question for today. And I'm going to launch it and give everybody a chance to answer. And our question is, do you currently use Dragonfly with deep learning? So yes, no, or yes, I use Dragonfly, but I don't use deep learning. So we'll give everybody a chance to answer the question. And we've got about more than 70% who have participated so far. So we'll give another few seconds. That's a good response. It's an active so, audience. Yes, yeah, it is. <laughs> Very active and engaged audience. So I'll give another three seconds. Three, two, one. I'll end the poll, share the results so you can all see it. And it's pretty mixed. So there's Ooh. some that are using it, but the majority are not. So I'm going to guess you're going to learn something great here today. So I'll stop sharing and hand it back to you guys. All right. All right, well, that's uh, with the first poll question uh, behind us. Oh, I keep uh, fighting with PowerPoint to advance to the next slide. There we are. Okay, so the first question I wanted to ask Mike on is this one. Just in case there are people who are not very familiar with the deep learning uh, to start with, let's ask him. So mm -hmm. what is deep learning? <laughs> okay, well, that's a great way to kick things off. <laughs> You're going to find a lot of people answer that very differently, and there are different uh, models and abstractions, and, and you can draw pictures, and you can show neurons. Let me try and answer it uh, this way. Deep learning is just one machine learning technique. We often hear about DL or ML or DLML. So deep learning is one machine learning technique, and it uses mathematical models called neural networks. So there are all sorts of different uh, machine learning mathematical equations and models that can help you solve problems and fit data. And so deep learning uses a model called neural networks. 
And we sometimes talk about convolutional neural networks, which are just one variant of neural network that are useful for processing images. So once you have the idea that you have a mathematical model, then what matters is that deep learning is just a model fitting process. So you have a model and you try and fit all the parameters of the model so the model predicts answers. And it's a model fitting process driven by an optimization routine. So ultimately the goal in most machine learning techniques is to fit all of the parameters to make the model give accurate predictions or to give useful results. So if we consider another optimization, suppose I have a scatter plot with a bunch of uh, XY coordinate points, I might want to fit that to a model. Here's a simple model, an equation of a line. It only has two parameters, y equals m x plus b, just the slope and the intercept. Here's a nice little optimization figure that comes from Logan Yang's uh, post story post over at Medium. And you can see that in this case, you're just varying those two parameters, the slope and the intercept, and you're going iteration after iteration. You've got some sort of optimizer updating those parameters. So that's a very simple model that tries to fit data. In this case, try and fit a scatter, a cloud of scatter points, and you've got two parameters. Well, deep learning is really just an extension of this, but instead of a model with two parameters, when we use a typical, a typical convolutional neural network, we might have 20 million free parameters. So it's far too complicated to express just as a simple equation, but it still goes through a process where some error function is computed, and then an optimizer tries to change the parameters with every update so that the error gets lower and lower and lower. Here on the left, we're looking at our error function at the end of every iteration or epoch. And on the right, we're seeing what the model predicts visually. Here, we're trying to get a model that labels all the small fibers as orange and all the big fibers as light blue. You can see it's, it's pretty bad at the beginning, just like the optimizer for the line was pretty far off but the optimizer moves in the right direction, the parameters get fit. So <clears throat> I had to deliberately slow down uh, this training so we could actually see something and let it evolve. Otherwise it just kind of uh, saturates and gets a correct answer pretty quickly. But I slowed it down from how we would normally do it in Dragonfly. And you can see just like the line gets closer and closer to the scatter points, you can see the labeling of the pixels gets uh, more and more accurate. So that's how I would answer the question, what is deep learning? It's a model fitting process with a special type of mathematical model called neural networks. So I think I'm gonna stop my answer right there and uh, maybe we have follow-up questions available. Uh, we have one, um, how difficult is it to learn deep learning? Mm -hmm. Well, um, if you want to learn it as a, that's a great question, by the way, if you want to learn it as a practitioner and <clears throat> you are a scientist who can collect image data, then you can learn how to exercise deep learning in an afternoon. And we have customers who don't know machine learning, don't know mathematical modeling, don't know anything about optimization. They just know what their data look like and what they want their results to look like. And that's really all you need to know to get started with a framework such as ours. You could always read papers and become an expert and write your own code, but we're here to deliver solutions so customers don't have to write their own code. So you can learn it in an afternoon, and it's really just about uh, identifying what your input data should be and what your output data should be, and then asking a model to learn some set of equations and some set of parameters to transform your input data into your output data. And all you have to know is what you want your output data to look like. That's our ground truth. And that's what, that's what it takes to set up uh, deep learning trainings in software like Dragonfly. So with that, I'll go to the next slide. You're muted, Angel. Uh, that always happens, right? <laughs> so uh, surprise, it's another polling question. So um, this question is launching now. And the question is, how much have you used deep learning for scientific imaging and applications if you are currently using it? So uh, have you never used it? Have you experimented once or twice? Have you successfully accomplished a task with deep learning? Or have you accomplished many tasks with deep learning? So we'll give everybody a chance to answer here. Mm, I'm excited. And to see yeah, about 75% answering, and it looks like 70% have, have at least used it and have some, some feedback here. So I'm going to end the poll in three, two, one, and I'm going to share the results with everyone 
And in this case, the majority says they've experimented once or twice, but it's a narrow majority. So, uh, and there are a few that are quite accomplished here. So yeah, kudos but, to you guys. I'll stop a, sharing and give it back. Yeah. Just almost a quarter have, have solved the task with deep learning. That's good. Uh, I, I like uh, I like to see a large uh, and emerging fraction of scientists who are who are succeeding with deep learning. Absolutely. Okay, so with that, let's move on to the next question. So in the polling question, we mentioned on um, imaging on applications, but that can mean many different things. So the next question we have for Mike is, when should we use deep learning for image segmentation? Right, well, th that's a good question. And if you've, if you've been through some of the Rogaku webinar series, you, you've seen a lot about image collection and image processing and how to analyze images. So image segmentation, the process of labeling pixels of phase A and maybe one color and pixels of phase two and another color and or phase B and phase C, et cetera. The process of segmentation is very useful for quantitative analysis and understanding volume fractions and shapes and uh, aspect ratios and fiber lengths, et cetera. So people have a lot of reasons for doing image segmentation, but when should you use deep learning versus maybe using one of the one of the more conventional or one of the more traditional methods. So when you watch those lectures, you see, okay, if I have a foreground material that's brighter than the surrounding, I might just threshold. And so should I just use thresholding instead of using deep learning? I would say only use thresholding as your method if the image analysts on your team have a protocol for determining the threshold value. And what I mean is you don't want to have data coming into the lab and one image analyst looks at the data one way and sets a threshold and another image analyst looks at the data and arbitrarily chooses a different threshold. If people are choosing different thresholds because they don't have a consistent protocol, then you're gonna have data inconsistency. So I like to use deep learning all the time because once you've trained a model, then you've removed all operator bias because whether I'm pushing the button to do deep learning inference or whether it's Aya or Angela, it's always gonna give the same result. Once the model's trained, it gives the same output. So I say use deep learning anytime you wanna remove operator bias, but it's obvious to use deep learning when you have large volumes of data that you wanna segment with the same accuracy and other methods are just not working for you. And you also, or, or maybe emphatically, you wanna use deep learning when the segmentation classes have just complicated textures that you with your eye and with your visual cortex and with your brain power, you can recognize the textures, but it's very difficult to encode that, that texture recognition into some sort of algorithm. And you don't wanna write a program to do image analysis and thresholding's not working. You've got complicated textures, but you can see, you know, this is a void or this is a different type of void or this is a one type of fiber and this is another type of fiber. If you can recognize it, then you can train a deep learning model to give you consistent results. So another question is, I, I mentioned in the previous answer that deep learning is just one type of machine learning. Maybe you want to know when should you use machine learning, other machine learning techniques instead of simply deep learning. And I, I would, the simple answer would be never because um, deep learning is really the state of the art in machine learning models. I, I have very rarely, I can't think of any off the top of my head, image problems that I can solve with a more conventional machine learning technique that I couldn't solve with a convolutional neural network. But maybe the answer to this question is if you have software that can do machine learning, but you don't have good enough hardware to do deep learning, maybe you don't have a GPU, then maybe you might use a machine learning technique. But I use deep learning to solve all of my image segmentation problems and I save the models and then they can be used on all the data coming into the lab so that we can really get a really consistent imaging chain and image analysis workflow, regardless of what image analyst is, is pushing the buttons that day. So I think that's my answer. When should we use deep learning? I use it all the time, um, but especially when I wanna remove, remove operator bias. So uh, uh, Viral, uh, that's the answer. Um, do we have any, any follow-up questions that have come on this one? Uh, we do. We have a couple, but I'm going to pick uh, this one. Uh, if random forest machine learning models work well, do you recommend using deep learning? Right. So that's a that's a good question. And, and that's really 
um, what I'm talking about at the end, uh, random forest is another mathematical model that's not neural networks. It's another machine learning technique. And, uh, you know, they were made popular by the, the Weka framework that um, I wish I knew the, the principal investigator's name that, that authored Weka, but it's popular in ImageJ and other tools. It's great and it worked well, but I don't have any problems that I could solve with Weka that I couldn't solve with a convolutional neural network. If you have a random forest uh, framework and you enjoy using it, you can keep using it. But I, I don't think you're going to find uh, any, certainly not many cases, where the random forest is going to outperform the deep learning. So if it works for you, use it. But if you want uh, to develop expertise in a tool chain that's going to work for all the problems that come your way, then I would consider switching from random forest to neural networks. All right, let's see what's next. Okay. So this is a question that Angela and I uh, get from our customers quite often. Which one is more important when it comes to training data? Is it the quality or the quantity of the data? Right. Well, that, that's another good question. I can see why you get that question all the time. Um, so I would say, you know, if you had to be as general as possible, uh, you want to strive for the quality data, but there's some caveats to that. I would say you can be sloppy and and produce lots of low quality training data whenever sloppy results are OK for you. So if I'm trying to trace the contours of my fibers and I'm too uh, uh, lazy or I've got too much to do to trace them carefully. And so I'm labeling all the fibers, but sometimes I miss the surface of the fiber, I, I, I go a few pixels too deep or too shallow in labeling it. If I train my model that way, and <clears throat> unless I have a truly random distribution of error, which is uh, hard to maintain, then you're going to find that your results, your individual results, are also going to be sometimes too shallow or too deep. And if all you care about is, is knowing where the fibers are, then you don't care about how sloppily labeled they are. So you can use sloppy labeling. But if you want to know for every fiber, what is its total volume or what is its diameter, then you need quality training data. So it's important to assess uh, what's important. You know, you could get to a case where you just care about the population of radius in your fibers or the population of fiber lengths, in which case it might be okay to be sloppy if individual fibers are wrong, but the population statistics are okay. But I would say, go with quality data uh, as your as your goal, but you can always start with sloppy training data. What we do in Dragonfly is we provide an iterative solution, so you can paint a, a frame of data, and it can be a little sloppy, and then you can train a model off that. And that model, if you make a prediction, it'll give you sloppy results. It'll also tell you where your model is not doing a good job, where your model is going wrong. So if you make a prediction with the model and the fibers are not very accurate. You can clean up the prediction and then add that into the training data. And so what happens is by you doing this iterative or bootstrapping process, you can train sloppy data for a few frames and then make predictions. And then it turns out it's faster to clean up sloppy predictions to make them quality data than to paint quality training data from scratch. So with this iterative process, uh, it's very reasonable to take a little bit of sloppy data make a model, make a prediction, then clean up, clean that up, make two or three predictions, clean that up. And now you have three or four times the training data. Probably one of the more important things I haven't said so far is uh, our users at Dragonfly by default make great use of data augmentation, which goes a long way to supplementing your data. So you have quality training data and by using data augmentation techniques, that really becomes quantity. So it's quality data and at high quantity. We use extensive use of data augmentation and it really makes a difference in making those models converge without users having to prepare lots of ground truth. So users don't need you know, uh, megapixels upon megapixels upon megapixels of training data. Uh, you, you, you can get away with you know, three to five megapixels and have really terrific results. It's just important that you have a balance of training data Everything you expect the model to encounter, 
If you expect it to encounter some beam hardening, you need to have some training data with beam hardening. If you expect it to see some forward scatter, you need to see some training data with forward scatter. Some blur, you need to see some with blur. You can only expect the model to learn from the examples it's given. So just make sure that you, you strive for quality and you have a balance of quality data encountering all the sorts of circumstances. It needs to be representative of what the model is going to be expected to segment in the end. Uh, so I think that's my answer. Any, any follow-ups on this one, uh, Viral? Yes. Um, in order to segment large number of 3D images, what is the best way to train the model? Uh, are you training a single image or subset slices of all images? Yeah. So if <clears throat> so, in our approach, we we consider a three D image in some ways to just be a stack of two D slices, and that model, uh, that mental model of, of thinking about the data that way, allows us to pick representative slices that on which we will we will paint ground truth. The process of labeling the data manually and the process of the deep learning model labeling the data, it's actually happening one slice at a time. It's not actually going one cube of data at a time. It's going one slice at a time. It's nuanced to understand this detail. It's going one slice at a time, but when it's trying to decide in slice number seven, uh, how do I paint this pixel here? Or how do I paint this pixel here? Is this phase A or phase B? Um, in a majority of our neural network models, it's looking at the pixels in slice seven, but it's also getting a chance to see what are the corresponding pixels look like in slice six or in slice eight. So even though it's only making a decision on slice seven, it's looking at a slab of data and then the window moves and now it's gonna make decisions about pixels in slice eight and now it's looking at slices seven, eight, and nine. Um, for you, you only have to paint a single slice at a time. You might paint slice 21 and you might paint slice 35 and that might be enough training data. So you're working with 3D data. The procedure by which the model processes and evaluates data is actually happening uh, by making a decision on one slice at a time. But depending on the model architecture, you're probably looking at uh, a regional context that includes a few slices in, in depth in the Z stack. So uh, there, I hope that answers that follow-up question. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next question. Um, this is a, certainly a challenge that I have um, dealt with in the past. I think Angela too. So how can we use a network trained on one data set to a segment to segment another data set from a similar sample? How can we apply one to the other? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And if you are following the right protocol, then you're going to be able to do this in many cases. But it depends on, I would say you would not be able to do it in all cases. So if you want to train a neural network to segment rechargeable batteries and you buy batteries from one vendor and they have a cathode material that's made of one chemistry and then you train a model to segment that and then you put in a battery from another vendor that has the same geometry but it has a different chemistry of cathode and therefore a different x-ray attenuation, a different texture, a different brightness, then the models are not going to extrapolate. It's like saying, I'm not gonna train a model that can label fibers in one sample and expect it to label uh, pores in another sample or even fibers in a completely different sample that has a different chemistry and different geometry. But you can segment, make models that will segment foams and then have you know different thickness of foam walls and uh, a slightly different geometries, but they've got the same material properties and the same more or less image contrast, then you can expect the model to extrapolate. So the question, how can we use a network trained on one data set to segment another data set from a similar sample is, you could put that question another way, when is my model overfit to my training data? And if your data are coming from the same type of samples, then it's not going to be overfit. And here's what you want to do to make sure your models do generalize appropriately. So the first is in Dragonfly, we give you a, an intensity calibration routine. It could be that you scan a foam on your CT scanner and 
uh, and the brightness of the foam walls is 42,000 counts, and you train a model to segment that foam wall and it does a perfect job. And then tomorrow you scan um, another foam from the same lot, but because of your CT scanner reconstruction parameters, maybe the foam walls, instead of being 42,000 counts, maybe they're 27,000 counts. And you try yesterday's model and it doesn't do a good job at all. Well, Dragonfly tells you to use calibration tools before you train and then on every data set you want to do deep learning inference on. And so you end up with the scale, uh, an arbitrary unit scale. It could be foam wall is 100 brightness units and air is zero brightness units. And when you import your data set, you do a quick calibration. It doesn't override or change any of your data, but it does make the values going into the deep learning consistent. So instead of 42,000 counts on one data set and 27,000 counts on the other data set, the deep learning routine just sees 100 counts in both, both, both cases. It's very simple to run the calibration, and then it means your model can work from CT scan to CT scan to CT scan because the brightness has been normalized and controlled. Another uh, topic on this question is there are generalized pre-trained models in Dragonfly that give you a big boost, and they're sort of a, what you might call a generic transfer learning solution. You can take models in Dragonfly that are pre-trained not to segment fibers or not to segment pores or to segment anything in particular. They're actually just trained on scientific images. And it turns out that when you go to train a new model, rather than training a model with randomized weights, which is maybe the default way to start a deep learning experiment, you can train a model that's already learned something about what I might call image vocabulary. These pre-trained models, they start to understand, oh, images are composed of brightness and darkness differences and uh, low gradient edges and high gradient edges and textures. And what happens is when you train with a pre-trained model, you basically short circuit the first part of the process and you're able to skip the first 10 to 20 epochs of training because the model already knows the vocabulary of images and it just starts asking itself, what weights do I attach to these different vocabularies in order to be predictive of labeling phase A or phase B? So we use these generalized pre-trained models and they give people a big uh, productivity boost. Another thing you can do is you can do cross-training. If you trained a model to segment batteries from one vendor, and then you say, you know what, I don't want to start from scratch uh, training a model to learn how to segment batteries from another vendor when the only difference is the cathode chemistry. You can take yesterday's battery model, make a copy of it, load it up, and then add just a little bit of training data from today's battery, and it will learn much faster to segment today's battery because it looks so much like yesterday's battery that it'll learn so much faster than if you started from scratch. So this cross training allows you to use pre-trained model and, and do what's called transfer learning. Um, it's an advanced technique. Uh, and if you look in the literature, you'll see that people have done this for a while where they do something called freezing the weights in your neural network model. And that's kind of like telling it, hey, I know what the vocabulary of images, don't try and relearn that, only spend time learning you know, what combination of image properties defines where my cathode is and what combination of image properties or weights define where my anode is. So Dragonfly has these ways of letting you use your neural networks extrapolate. But I have users who are doing um, not x-ray tomography. The, the one that comes to mind is, is electron tomography. I've got users that are doing cryo-electron tomography where they have a consistent imaging protocol. They train the model on one to two data sets and then they use that model on 140 data sets so they could output all of the results. So it's, it's no problem to make models that will work on other data sets as long as you're, you have reasonable expectations. Like I said, you're not gonna train a data set on, on foams and expect it to segment batteries, but it'll segment other foams that, have, uh, that are from the same, same lot or the same chemistry or just they're similar foams. Uh, so Viral, with that, uh, are there any follow-ups on, on this question? I've uh, got a few. I'm going to pick one, though. Uh, is it possible to adjust the model quickly to segment a similar data set, which was recorded slightly different settings, so different voxel size, perhaps? Hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Um, voxel size is it can be a thorn in your side. Um, and what I mean is the the neural network models 
they are trained on a particular sampling rate or a particular voxel size. And if I train on a data set where my voxel size is five microns per pixel, and then tomorrow I want to apply it on a data set that's 50 microns per pixel, you're just not going to have any luck. Um, the models do have that constraint. Now, I think you can probably get away with plus or minus 75% voxel size. That's not uh, experimental results talking, that's just intuition talking. So there's going to be some tolerance in allowing you to change the voxel size, but you're not going to be able to change it by an order of magnitude and expect it to continue to work. But the bottom line is you can just take a copy of yesterday's model and load it and then say, I want to add just one frame of training data for today's data set and then start training. And you'll see that leveraging yesterday's model, even if it didn't work uh, before any additional training, it will learn very, very quickly if there's a lot of similarity between yesterday's data and today's data. All right, I think I will uh, advance and see what's next. Oh no. Lightning round. Yeah. I, so I, I didn't we're going to so change well. the pace a little bit. And... Well, light, lightning round is not my strength, Aya. <laughs> but there is no right or wrong answers to this. <laughs> yeah. All so right. I'm going to ask him like a bunch of questions. You know, we're trying to get to know him better. Okay. okay. Well, hit me. All right. <laughs> First question Where did you go to school? <laughs> Uh, well, I went to University of the South in Suwannee, Tennessee for two and a half years, and then uh, Centenary College in Shreveport, Louisiana is where I finished up with a degree in chemistry. And, uh, and your fun fact is, uh, even though I'm, I'm pretending to be an expert here today, I've only ever had one semester of math when I was in college. So see, there you go. You wanted a five, five second answer for lightning round. And I already, there I already you go. That's perfect. That. Does this mean that we don't need a degree in math? To do this, yeah. Well, I, I I think that's true. You do not need a degree in math. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not even close. No worries. That's close. good to know. Um, what is your favorite imaging technique? You know, right now it's micro CT. Uh, I, I grew up in uh, uh, cryoelectron microscopy, and I've done a lot. But uh, micro CT has got my attention right now because I, I'm fascinated by the artifacts and how to clean yeah, up. That's the right stuff. answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, what would you be doing if you hadn't gone into image analysis? Maybe just spend more time playing with the dogs. Uh, <laughs> I, maybe you mean vocationally, <laughs> professionally. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, uh, oh, you know what? When I was in high school, I wanted to be a lawyer. There you go. <laughs> I think it would have been a good one. <laughs> no, who knows? Um, do you think chat GPD will take over the world? <laughs> um, no, chat GPT will not take over the world. Chat GPT, both three and especially 3.5 or four, um, will be transformative to a number of industries and a number of industries will adopt techniques that make workers more productive. In some cases, it'll eliminate workforces and with things that we can, we can pay computers a, a cheaper rate to do. So it's gonna be transformative to the economy um, in a number of sectors. Uh, and that's just going to be the, the direction that we experience. We'll see those disruptions. Um, a lot of them will be for, for, for good, but it won't take over the world. It will not become Skynet. Um, we won't hit the singularity here in the next uh, uh, five to 10 years. But not anytime soon, right? No, no. Okay. Um, two more questions. Will people still be using thresholding to segment the images 10 years from now? Uh, yeah, but they won't know it. Um, they'll they'll be clicking a button that says segment my image, and it'll give them 10 segmentations and look at the screen and one of them will be perfect. And they'll say, okay, that's the one I want to use. And they won't care what technique it's using, uh, just that it gives robust answers. So the machines are going to be fitting all the parameters, and you're not going to be making choices. But that, you know, that's a prediction. Did, did you say 10 years from now? You probably, yeah. won't, even, you probably won't even uh, say segment my image. You'll say, here's a, a foam image. What's the volume fraction of air? You'll like ask chat GPT, what's the volume fraction of air in this image? And it'll go and segment it for you and tell you the answer. So uh, 10 years is, a, is extremely long time. So uh, uh, no, people won't be dragging sliders for thresholding anymore, but the machine might use it if, if it decides it's the best thing to do, but you won't, you won't know what it's doing. See, that sounds very nice, but although it's threatening to me and Angela. <laughs> 
Uh-oh. Uh, someone's someone's going to be cast aside. Yeah. Uh, last question. What changes or developments in the CT industry do you think we will see in the next 10 years? Hmm. Um, we'll see the, uh, likely we'll see the adoption of uh, spectral detectors. Um, there's at least one player in the laboratory micro CT market that has a product out. There's a, a vendor that's making detectors. So that'll, uh, you'll see that happening. Um, the other thing I think we'll see is we'll see the evolution of scintillators on detectors that give us more sensitivity uh, without sacrificing uh, uh, resolution. And uh, just because I think people are going to work out the math that makes that better. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, as we continue to develop uh, higher power sources that can generate a lot of photon flux without making the spot size too big. It's hard to do both um, without making the spot size too big and without overheating. Um, then you can image faster. And I think people will can keep working on next generation sources. Well, I mean, you guys are, are a, a source technology company. So uh, X-ray lamps and X-ray sources, you guys probably have uh, are thinking about those things for sure. Um, I think all of those uh, will be creeping into the micro CT product market. Um, and uh, none of those by themselves sounds that transformative. Um, and of course, we'll see more and more deep learning uh, uh, to improve images and make segment make image quality better. So yeah, a lot of those things, uh, that's just kind of a hodgepodge of what will happen. OK, thank you. <laughs> OK, are we through with okay. the lightning round? Uh-huh. OK. All right. <laughs> All right, what's next? All right, here we are. Aha, another polling question. So, uh, all right. So the next polling question is launching now. And uh, we want to know what's the most important factor for you when you choose scientific imaging software? So do you choose it for ease of use, perhaps cost or features, or does support matter for you? So which of those is most uh, important when you choose software? I can't wait to yeah. see the sort of Oh, there's a, there's a clear winner this time, oh. Mike. So, uh, yeah. And All right. Well, this is oh, this oh, is it's, the race is out. So we've got about sixty percent. <laughs> wait for a couple more. Three, two. Come on, eat it out. One more. Uh, one more second. All right. In the poll and share the results. The clear uh -huh. winner here is features, but also everyone wants something that's easy to use, and perhaps doesn't cost too much and has good yeah. support. This is very revealing. I'm going to have to very revealing. go back to the product yeah. management meetings and, and prioritize accordingly. Now we exactly. know what people want. <laughs> exactly. So I'll stop sharing and back to you guys. All right. What's, uh, what is next? Okay. So a couple more questions for you, Mike. <laughs> How should we evaluate the quality or accuracy of a train network? Yeah. Well, you, you got good questions for me today. I, that's another hard one. Um, so I can tell you procedurally how to do it, um, but it's, it's still difficult to answer. So what you want to do is you want to use some ground truth training data to train the model. Hey, these are the results I expect you to learn from. But you, save aside, you set aside some ground truth to evaluate your model and you use a tool in Dragonfly. It's just called deep learning model evaluation. And what it can do is it can provide a score that tells you how well a model scores in terms of what you might call accuracy or what you might call quality. Unfortunately, depending on your task, you might define quality differently. So it's very important to keep in mind that the right evaluation metric or the might or the right scoring function depends on the task and the problem being solved. I mean, the simple way to think about this is. You know, if I am a physician looking at radiographs of, of a chest and I want to know, is there a lung cancer tumor in this radiograph, then you could have something that segments tumors as a deep learning model. And you could say every time it finds a tumor correctly, that's a true positive. And every time it fails to find a tumor, that's a false negative. So, you know, it finds tumors and it misses tumors, but you could say sometimes it labels things that aren't tumors, it labels them as tumors. And so that's a false positive. And probably worst of all is sometimes there are tumors there and it doesn't show them to you, it doesn't label them, so you've got a false negative. 
Okay, false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives. There are functions that weight these. Uh, you can weight them all equally, or you can say, well, you know what, for my task, even if I get some false positives, I really don't wanna miss any breast cancer. I don't wanna send any patient home saying you're clear when in fact a fault, there was a false negative and they had a, a, a tumor that could have been identified or labeled correctly. So, you know, it depends on your, your goals uh, and that will inform what scoring function you wanna use. So what I show at the bottom of this slide are some scoring functions. The ones on the left are scoring functions that help you compare a, a grayscale images. So uh, those are regression models. But what we've been talking about today are image segmentation models, and those scoring functions are shown on the right. The one that we use most often that's quite common is the dice coefficient. And this is a derivative of the, of the Sorensen dice coefficient. You can read about this in a Wikipedia article or you can go back and find the original literature. And this is a way of weighting uh, false positives and true positives and, and false negatives and true negatives. But it's a way of doing it for a multi-class labeling system because we're not just binary. It's not just <clears throat> a lot of our cases are not just binary. Is this pixel tumor or not? Is is this pixel fiber? Is this pixel uh, you know coded fiber or is this pixel background or is this pixel void? So you might have four or five classes, and there are mathematical expressions that can evaluate the accuracy of the model. The ones on this list that are marked O R S in front, those are equations that we didn't develop, we didn't invent the math, but we programmed them into Dragonfly. The ones that don't say ORS in front, those are part of the common uh, toolbox. So we're using uh, Google's TensorFlow library, uh, which we use an abstraction like everyone else called Keras, and Keras already implements the functions for categorical accuracy, categorical cross entropy, etc. The ones marked ORS, they're, they're well-defined scoring functions, but they weren't already implemented in Keras, so we, we implemented them, we just denote. So if you're ever looking at the documentation and you say, well, what is categorical cross-entropy? Well, you could look at the literature to read about categorical cross-entropy. You could look at the Google's TensorFlow documentation to learn about categorical cross-entropy. But if you go to dice coefficient, you'll, you'll know there's no documentation on that in Keras, at least not in the Keras version when we first implemented dice coefficient. You'll know that that's developed by our team. So. The reason that's such a hard question is I'm not telling you which function to use, and that's because I can't. It depends on what your task is. So the good part about this is it's there's a tool in, in Dragonfly that does allow you to use any of these scoring functions to give you an answer, and these scoring functions are quite transparent. They're well documented in the literature, but you have to decide what does quality mean for your particular network. You might segment fibers in pores, and it might be that if you miss a pore, this part in your automobile engine is going to fall apart and blow up the engine. And so fibers are important to label, but pores are super critical. So you may need a scoring function that's weighted, got weighted sensitivity towards pores. So the quality or accuracy of your network model really depends on your scientific and engineering objectives. So I'm just waving my hands and saying it depends. Um, and, and that's the best I can do, because if I just gave you an answer, it would be wrong for, you know, most of you most of the time um, without knowing uh, your particular conditions. So the, the, the short answer, which I'm way past giving you a short answer, the short answer is set aside some data. And then in Dragonfly, you can take one model or all of your models and put it, uh, uh, put it through the same scoring functions um, with, with the same evaluation data and get these scores out and know how well it does on, on validation data, that on, on um, evaluation ground truth data that it's never seen before. That would be the best practice. So with all that hot air, I'll move on and let, uh, let Viral ask me a follow-up question. I think uh, we have a few from this question as well, and you answered uh, one of them, sort of, uh, but there's another one. If my training data has pixel imbalance, what is a good scoring function? Uh, background pixel is zero um, and two more pixel is one. Is uh, I don't know if that makes sense to you. But. So you um, you can definitely train deep learning models with an imbalance of training data. If I am trying to segment a model to recognize and label cracks in a casting or a plastic part or whatever, I may only have. 50 pixels of crack, and I may have 100 million pixels of non-crack. 
And therefore, if I use all the data, I'll have a strong imbalance. Now, um, for us, I see models succeed all the time where one class has only 1% of uh, the labels in the training data. So you can have a 100 to 1 ratio and still, still do well. So uh, imbalance is important, but it, you don't, it doesn't have to be like a 50-50 balance. Now, the question the user is asking about, or the, the, the participant is asking, is not about evaluating the accuracy, but maybe about the, the loss function or the scoring function to be used during training. So you can make this quite complicated and you can have some functions you use to evaluate the accuracy of your model and have different functions that the optimizer evaluates during training. And that function that the optimizer evaluates during training is called the loss function uh, or an error function. And you can, in Dragonfly anyway, you can tell the loss function, hey, do you know what? Pixels in this label are 80%, uh, uh, or let's say matter eight times more than pixels in this label. So you can, you can apply arbitrary weights, or you can even tell it, you know what, I know I've got class imbalance, so I'd like you to weight pixels inversely proportional to their abundance. And then all the crack pixels become much more important to get those accurate, even uh, get to report those accurately, even though there are fewer of them. Uh, but you can look at, we don't have a, a slide or a question on scoring functions for training. We do a lot of research on that. And we're always, well, I know in the last version and in the next version of Dragonfly, we're bringing in new scoring functions. It's a pretty uh, nuanced topic to try and tune your deep learning model by changing the scoring function. Um, and uh, that, 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 gets, that gets into the weeds pretty quickly. Fortunately, for 95% of our use cases, you can just use a standard, uh, a standard model with the standard categorical cross entropy scoring function, which is both a loss function and a scoring function for evaluating the model, and you do pretty well. So tough question to answer. Um, class imbalance, I don't have any specific guidance of what loss function you wanna change because of class imbalance, um, but you do have a lot of choices to choose from. And I'll answer this a little bit more. I think it's in the next question. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll go on. Okay. So the next question is, which deep learning model architecture should we use and when? Yeah. Yep. You and the whole world want to know the answer to that one, Aya. Which network should we use and when? The answer is no one knows. But... Um, I still have models that I can use that just work great 90 to 95% of the time. So I use 2.5 dimensional models that look at the slice I'm trying to label and then look at some of the neighboring slices. And I do that anytime I think there's a little more information to be gained by looking at the adjoining slices. So you can have a, a, a network architecture of type UNet that is just 2D and only uses the slice of interest, or you can have a 2.5 dimensional model that uses the slice of interest and maybe something two slices before and two slices after, so it gets a little 3D context. We call that a 2.5D model. Or, uh, and, and by the way, the 2.5D models, that's what I grab all the time and I use that and that's what's working for me 99, 90 to 95% of the time. You can also use 3D models. So you can use 2D models, 2.5D models, or 3D models. The 3D models I would use for your most complicated 3D textures that it's just, you just need to look fully in 3D space to get a proper context to know uh, what am I seeing. I've looked at some uh, mesoscale composites. You may have some carbon fiber reinforced composites or some other composites. And at the mesoscale, you may not be able to resolve the individual fibers, but you see different texture and you may need to look at the 3D uh, texture to correctly label it. Now, this ties in with the last question because should I use a unit? Should I use an attention unit? Should I use, what architecture should I use? Should I use a 2.5 uh, dimensional model? Should I use a three dimensional model? Um, should I try unit, two different versions of the same unit model but with different loss functions? Yeah, so this gets complicated really quickly. Unfortunately, no one knows the parameter space is so wide. People just keep reporting. They do trial and error and they report, hey, this worked. It's very, very difficult to sample the space and come up with a solution. Somebody tried to come up with a solution. There's a, a paper um, from 
uh, about a year and a half ago in Nature Methods. Uh, it's called No New Units. It's called NNUNet. It's a paper uh, comes from uh, someone named Fabian Eisensee and coworkers. This is in Nature Methods in 2021. And they tried to build a model that looks at your data and then picks the right unit architecture and then, or uh, runs multiple unit architectures and then takes sort of the best results from each. We've experimented with that in Dragonfly, but we haven't put it in the software. So everyone sort of struggles with this problem, which network. Fortunately, I can just use a 2.5 dimensional unit 95% of the time. And then if that's not getting me what I want with a reasonable amount of training data, then I can, I can try a few other architectures. But what Dragonfly gives you is the segmentation wizard. And the segmentation wizard gives you a tool for painting ground truth really easily. And it encapsulates all of your ground truth. And then you can say, all right, I've got all this training data. Do you know what? I don't know if I should use model A or model B. Train model A and model B and model C. I'm going to come back in five hours and I'm just going to look at all the results side by side and see which one's working. So it makes it very easy for the end user to compare different model architectures, different loss functions, or whatever parameter it is you're experimenting with, uh, because you get to use the same training data in one interface and just train all these variants and then compare them side by side, either numerically or graphically. You can compare the evaluation data, how well they did. Uh, each model did, or you can compare visually and see uh, this one to my eye looks like it's doing the right job. All right, I better uh, uh, better give us time for our last few questions. So um, I'm, I'll throw it back to you, Viral, to see if we have any follow ups on this one. Uh, not on this one particularly, but I would like to go back to uh, one of the previous questions. Uh, said, suppose my 3D data is made of 100 2D slices. Is it a good strategy to label one in 10 slices and then train a, a deep learning model? Yeah, that's a great strategy. So you can you can paint slice 10, slice 20, slice 30, et cetera, and put all that as training data. And then you know you've you've sampled uh, through the different balance of, of whatever your, however your sample varies from Z equals uh, one to Z equals 100. Um, it's very rare, you'll, you'll need 10 full slices of data um, with segmentation wizard, you might start with slice 10, slice 50, and slice 90. Uh, and if that doesn't get what you want, then maybe add a few more, add a little more sampling in between. But yeah, that's a that's a great approach. In fact, in Dragonfly, we have a tool that uh, generates a, a mask. You just tell it how how frequently you want the mask sampled. Uh, but in in segmentation wizard, it's also very easy to go right to slice 10, add a frame. Go right to slice 50, add a frame. Right to slice 90, add a frame and then you know, go frame one, frame two, frame three, and, and paint in your ground truth. Or paint one, train a model, use it to predict on slice 50, clean it up, and, and bootstrap your way forward. OK, I'll turn the page. Oh, I've got another polling question. All right, uh, so this will be the last polling question, and it's launching now. The question is, what's the most important hardware factor for high-performance deep learning? Uh, in this case, hard drive, GPU, CPU, and RAM are and uh, see, uh, all the options here. Maybe let's, we'll find out that this audience didn't need to come. Maybe they already knew the answer to all these questions. Okay, see, yeah. See to come away with. There is an absolute clear winner at this point with uh, 60 or 70% participation. And it looks like it's going to stand. So I'll give a few more yeah. seconds. And then we will wrap up this poll three, two, one, and here are the results, guys. Uh oh, <laughs> GPU uh, was the winner wow. in this case. So, what say you, Mike? What's the answer? I'll stop sharing. Well, I think uh, well that reveals our audience uh, uh, already has some uh, some knowledge in this area because that's the right answer. But um, I think that uh, takes us to our our next question, right? Okay, so this is the last question that we had for you. How can we build a workstation to achieve the best performance of Dragonfly deep learning tools? Okay, well, I can see why you'd get that question. I, I'm, I'm having success. How do I speed it up? Mm -hmm. um, well, the short answer is maybe get the most expensive NVIDIA GPU you can afford that's compatible with your computer. It's got to support your OS and your operating and your got to have to be drivers available, but there almost always are if you're buying a new one. It has to be compatible with your motherboard that is has to have the right sort of PCIe slot, for example. 
Uh, this is something people may forget to look at is it has to have a, a sufficient, you have your power supply has to be able to power this GPU and you have to have space in your case, um, in your computer case. That's the short answer. Get the most expensive NVIDIA GPU you can afford that's compatible with your computer. The longer answer is you can consider differences in GPUs. So NVIDIA makes gaming GPUs like the GeForce cards, workstation GPUs, which they used to call Quadro cards. Now they sometimes call just RTX cards, but not GeForce RTX cards. There can be a lot of nomenclature challenges here. And then they make data center GPUs, which used to be called Tesla cards. Now they might be called just the A100 uh, or the A60. So a lot of complicated nomenclature here. But the reason you might consider differences is the gaming GPUs um, may have less RAM. They may not have as many uh, what are called CUDA cores, which the deep learning engine leverages to do uh, all of its updates on the model to change all of those weights and do all this expensive process called back propagation. So you need a lot of CUDA cores. So if you have time to dive into it, you can compare the price of one GPU versus another and also see how many CUDA cores it has. Uh, so that's a little bit of a deeper answer. You get more, more performance out of more CUDA cores, but you also get more performance out of more recent generation cards. So if you look at the NVIDIA cards that are available, you can research them and find that some are uh, the latest generation called Ada Lovelace, or you can see the previous generation, which were called Ampere, or the previous generation, which was Turing, I think. Um, so, and then you go back to Maxwell and Pascal or Pascal and Maxwell. So anyway, there are a lot of generations in cards. Now, the other part of the longer answer is um, you may see that if you're relying heavily on data augmentation, right now in Dragonfly at least, and for now at least, that's a process that happens on the CPU. So if you have a slow CPU, you could hit a little bit of a bottleneck there, but likely your bottleneck is going to be the GPU crunching. Uh, in the future, we may move some of our data augmentation to GPU. If you ever look at Dragonfly and you look at the system monitor and you say, why is it not using my GPU 100%? It's because you're using data augmentation. If you turned off data augmentation, you'd see your GPU usage go up to like 95%, but you're not going to solve your problem faster because you, you've stopped getting the advantage of data augmentation. Uh, RAM can become important, especially when you have a large number of, of material classes you're segmenting and you're, you're doing inference on large slices. Uh, but I don't think you need to worry about getting 128 gigs of RAM. For most people, 64 gigs of RAM is going to be adequate for most scientific imaging endeavors. Um, for doing this sort of inference. But, you know, people can always push the boundaries. So I think that's my answer. I don't even know if we have time for a follow up, but I'll throw it back to you, Viral. A um, couple follow ups. Okay. Uh, one, I know you mentioned the mass generating tool uh, previously. Mm -hmm. uh, would you be able to share the name of that uh, that you might have mentioned? And the other one was, what's the most expensive GPU you personally use? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so the mask generating tool, uh, you can, I think you can right click on an ROI. Uh, gosh, I don't, I, I don't know, I, I use it so rarely. Um, I think you can right click on an ROI and just say generate mask and it will pop up a dialogue that says, okay, how wide do you want your painted slices to be in X and in Y? And then do you want them painted on every slice in Z or just every 10th slice? So you get to choose the lateral extent in each, each axis and you get to choose the sampling in each axis. Um, so uh, yeah, whoever asked that question, we can, we can certainly send an, an email to follow up so they can, they can know where this is so they don't have to paint a mask manually. It doesn't take long to paint a mask, but it's certainly convenient to, to introduce a systematic mask. Um, wait, was that the whole question? Or was there another part of the question? No, I was just, uh, that was, the other question was, what's the most expensive GPU you've ah, used? Right. <laughs> um, so I do most of my work on my desktop where I'm using a Pascal class card that cost $700 in 2018. So that was five years ago. And that's a in NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080. Uh, <clears throat> but I also use a remote server uh, that we share. And that has a... Uh, just before Ampere. So uh, is that a Turing class? I got to remember, but it has a RTX 8000. Um, and uh, and that, <clears throat> that was a top of the line card when it was the latest generation, but we we're like 
we've already had the Ampere generation come out and another generation come out since. And that most expensive card, that, that, that RTX 8000, it was probably five to $6,000 US when it came out compared to my $700 GeForce GTX 1080. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay, um, as I turn the page, I see we're at just a couple of announcement slides. So uh, I would tell anyone that's interested that um, uh, for our community anyway, we're having a Dragonfly users group meeting. We're, we're all filled up for in-person spots uh, the meeting is going to be in Ann Arbor, but we have uh, unlimited spots for people that want to attend the sessions remotely and watch the, the lectures and talks on YouTube. So this will be a chance to see what other users are doing in Dragonfly when they're making presentations. And then we'll show uh, some best practices and some uh, new features and what's coming next. So we'll have some of the Dragonfly team presenting. If you want to register and get the Zoom invite so you can attend those lectures, um, here's a link at the bottom. Just go to orss.ca slash UGM. That's user group meeting 23. And, uh, and then you can uh, enroll and, and you'll, you'll end up getting a link to join the, uh, we'll create the link in a week or so. You'll get the links where you can join the Zoom uh, invite. All right. And then there's one more slide in this deck. I think this is for you, Vero. Uh, yep. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, Everyone, please don't forget to join us next month. Uh, we will be talking to Joshua Lameo and uh, discussing advancing drug development with high resolution X-ray CT. Uh, Josh will be discussing DGM solutions and transformation of decision-making with digital assets. And that webinar is scheduled for April 19th uh, at 1 p.m. Central, just like today. And I will be sharing the link over here in the chat so you can register um but that's uh next month with that being said thank you all for joining us today and see you next month bye, bye everyone thank you. thanks